Um, my name is Frank LaFerla. I'm the uh, Hannah and Francisco J. Ayala Dean in the new Ayala School of Biological Sciences. And welcome to this, our 24th uh, anniversary of this wonderful lecture series in honor of Howard Schneiderman. Uh, I don't mind telling you that um, when I was doing my homework in terms of becoming dean, I asked many of the senior faculty who was the best uh, dean in the school, and almost universally everyone referred to uh, Howard Schneiderman. And I asked them, well, what made him such a, a great dean? And they said it was his personality. He just was a tour de force, and he would just go up and give everyone a big bear hug. And they said, that's the role model that you want to try to model your uh, deanship off of. Uh, so we'll have to ask Audrey if all of that's true. But um, we're really honored that we have um, Audrey Schneiderman here, who's a great friend uh, to the school. And we really appreciate all of the years of support that you have given uh, the now Ayala School of uh, the Biological Sciences. Also, of course, want to thank um, our staff in the dean's office, uh, Brian Carlson in the back, and Alyssa Sanchez for all the hard work that they do in helping uh, to organize this. And of course, the associate deans, Robin Bush uh, and Dave Gardner, for helping to put uh, this topic together. I think it's going to be a really uh, exciting. Uh, evening uh, tonight. We have a very uh, dynamic speaker, and I hope I'm not letting any secrets out of the bag by saying that pretty soon she'll be uh, a colleague of ours because she'll be moving to the uh, law school here come July 1st. So we're very, very excited uh, by that. <clears throat> so. Uh, very dynamic and exciting uh, individual and scholar. Uh, she is uh, currently the Everett uh, Frazier Professor of Law at the University of Minnesota. I would say that the weather is a little bit better here, but I'm not so sure that that's necessarily true today. Uh, as a matter of fact, we probably lost a lot of few folks to uh, some of the local fires. Uh, that are going on there. Uh, so, um, you know, prior to teaching uh, law, Dr. Goodwin was a postdoctoral fellow at Yale University, and her research there helped to contribute to our understanding of uh, human experimentation on female slaves uh, in the United States during the antebellum um, period. Uh, she has won many, many uh, awards. I could spend all night just staying up here reading some of them. But she has um, been uh, featured in the New York Times, Washington Post, Chicago Sun-Times, Forbes Magazine, the Christian Science Monitors. Uh, she is a very prolific author and has published four books and more than 60 law review articles, book chapters, and book reviews. Uh, she's all, as, uh, you know, as was evident from all those places that she's appeared, a, a constant blogger, and her opinion is highly sought after on issues of health, class, uh, race, and uh, gender. As you would expect of someone of her stature, she has won many, many awards, um, including uh, some like the Faculty Achievement Award, the Outstanding Scholarship Award, the Black Pearl Award, the Urban League Women's History Month Honor, the Chicago uh, History Museum Pioneering Woman, uh, Woman Award, and the one I found most intriguing was in 2001, the Governor of Kentucky commissioned her as a colonel for her outstanding contributions in education. So that's um, uh, pretty amazing. So I guess we should salute as well. So anyway, let's welcome a very distinguished speaker here today. Thank you. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Thank you all for coming out. I very much appreciate it. Now, I'm, I'm getting set up here with my timer to make sure that I uh, don't go over. Uh, it's an honor and a pleasure to be here. Uh, it's, it's an honor because you've extended me this invitation to share my research with you. And I want to thank some of the people who helped to make this possible, including Robin Bush, who chaired the Schneiderman Memorial Bioethics Committee, uh, Mrs. Audrey Schneiderman, who's here this evening. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, Dr. Michael uh, Bookmeyer, uh, Dr. Felicia Kahn, Dr. Sheldon Greenfield. These are some of the people who, are, who served on the committee, including Dr. Stuart Kasn Krasner, uh, Dr. Marcus Ribby, uh, and Elisa Sanchez, who made all of my arrangements possible, and also Dean Frank LaFerla, uh, who invited me here. So let's get started with this talk. Now, in the season opening, 
of Mad Men, a show on the AMC network. The show's protagonist, uh, Donald Draper, it's not supposed to end after one minute. Look at that. <laughs> Talk's over. Okay, so, so much for my timer. Okay, uh, Don, who has worked closely with uh, his colleagues um, at the advertising agency, believes that he can share a deeply personal story about his birth and how he grew up. He believes that he can tell this story, which replaces the truth that his colleagues have believed for some time, and that his colleagues will be prepared not only to hear it in the manner in which he intends, but there will not be costs associated for sharing the information. As those of you who watch the show, and I have to admit, I don't even watch the show, but for those of you who know, he's, he's wrong. Don reveals a very powerful story, though, uh, in front of a potential client who's also there with his colleagues. So it turns out that Don Draper, or Dick Whitman, his true identity, was born in 1926. Dick was the illegitimate child of a prostitute who died during childbirth. Uh, Dick lived with his father uh, and his father's wife until he was about 10, at which time his alcoholic father uh, gets hurt by a horse that kicks his father in the face. He sees this, his father dies. Soon after that, uh, his stepmother moves him and she herself, they move into a brothel. And so he grows up in a brothel and he's raped as a child by a prostitute. Dick's life, including dropping out of high school and going into the military, changes when he's in military service in the Korean War uh, and he assumes the identity of the real Don Draper. Um, and he does this after Don Draper is killed and they're off uh, in a secluded location actually building a hospital. Uh, Dick switches the ID tags with Lieutenant Draper and assumes Draper's name, cutting off contact with his family and creating a whole new life for himself. And you figure, you know, given the life that he had, why wouldn't he try to find a new life? So Don tells this gripping story in front of his colleagues and a client. He tells it because he wants to engage with clean hands. He tells it because he believes that he can. And those of you who, know, who watch the show know the rest. His colleagues actually force him to leave the firm, if not indefinitely, certainly for a very long time. Now, you may wonder, what does Don Draper, someone that I don't know, and I don't know uh, John Hamm either, um, what would he have to do with this talk? On one hand, he's a man, uh, I'll be talking about women. Biologically, he cannot become pregnant. I'll be talking about pregnant women. However, he is complicated. He's addicted to alcohol and with a challenging family background, much like the women who feature in my research and this talk. There's also the connection to truth-telling and the consequences that can unfold from truth-telling. In essence, trust, lo loyalty, and fiduciary duties have much to do with my talk. Some of those same things happen to, to deal with uh, Don Draper and what he admitted to his colleagues. Now, you see, doctors and lawyers, and the talk is in part about the legal and medical divide that engages pregnant women these days, have very interesting and similar relationships with vulnerable individuals. Unfortunately, doctors' patients sometimes become lawyers' clients, and this is not a talk about medical malpractice. Um, rather, both doctors and lawyers work with and provide services to people who are hurt and who are hurting. Sometimes our clients or patients are the victims of others' actions, such in cases involving domestic violence, and other times our clients or patients are people who have actually harmed themselves. And these people, particularly during the space of pregnancy, are coming to the attention of states, or states are placing attention on these people. Increasingly, state statutes are the primary means in which legal norms affecting low-income pregnant women's autonomy, privacy, and liberty are introduced and shaped. Arrests, forced bed rests, compelled cesarean sections, and civil incarceration of pregnant women in a number of states, including Florida, Iowa, Indiana, Mississippi, 
South Carolina, Utah, Alabama, Arkansas, New Mexico, and Texas merely scratched the surface of a broad attack on pregnant women. This recent era of maternal policing, I would argue, reshapes physician and police interactions with pregnant women accused of violating fetal protection laws is what I call them, fetal protection laws. And it sometimes inspires or even demands and requires medical officials to breach fiduciary duties such as confidentiality when treating pregnant women. Increasingly, it motivates selective prosecutions against pregnant women, particularly those of color, and invents improper judicial deference to medical authority rather than to law. Now, my talk today makes two claims. First, it argues that doctors breach what should be an unwavering duty of confidentiality to pregnant patients by trampling well-established expectations of the patient-physician relationship. And the second aspect of this talk argues that even if state's chief goals are to promote fetal health by enacting protective laws, Punitive state interventions contravene the very objectives that states uh, seek to enforce. So if the idea is protecting health and promoting health, actually incarcerating pregnant women at the time in which they're seeking prenatal care doesn't actually achieve that particular goal. Now, one thing that I want to start off with uh, with this talk is, is to say that this is not a talk about uh, slamming my, my colleagues who are doctors. I also have a a joint appointment in the medical school at the University of Minnesota. So that while this is a critique about what is happening in the field, there are many courageous doctors who uh, try to stem the tide of what it is that I will be talking about. So imagine a time when fetal protection uh, legislation emboldens a state attorney to prosecute a woman for smoking a cigarette. On one hand, inhaling nicotine or carcinogens undoubtedly risks both pregnant women's health and that of their fetuses. On the other hand, cigarette smoking is otherwise a rigorously defended legal activity. State governments persistently choose not to ban cigarette smoking, despite concerns for public health and safety and ongoing civil litigation against tobacco com companies. But does the state's asserted special solicitude for fetal health justify prosecuting pregnant women for smoking? And would such prosecutions pass constitutional muster? When the state chooses to prosecute a pregnant woman for threatening fetal health, it raises a host of questions. For example, under what circumstances and justifications does it do so? Why does some conduct during pregnancy and not others raise red flags and lead to punitive state interventions? What does these choices signify regarding the exercise of prosecutorial discretion? Finally, how should we assess the constitutionality of these prosecutorial choices? These questions are important because state statutes are the primary means through which medical and constitutional norms, including selective invasions of privacy, disclosure of medical information, arrests, prosecutions, and convictions relating to pregnant women are introduced and shaped. A recent report issued by the National Advocates for Pregnant Women uh, and their director, Lynn Paltrow, underscores this point. The authors document over 400 cases from 1973 through 2005 in which pregnancy was a necessary factor leading to attempted and actual deprivations of pregnant women's physical liberty. Their account of fetal protection interventions on pregnant women adds to the earliest literature in this field examining the intersections of race and sex in policing women's reproduction. Nearly 25 years ago, Professor Dorothy Roberts offered a chilling account of government interventions in the pregnancies of low-income, drug-addicted African-American women. Roberts exposed race as an intrinsic and entrenched aspect 
of fetal protection prosecutions in the United States during the 1980s and the 1990s. She explained how state intrusions on the pregnancies of poor women of color, quote, are particularly harsh because these women are the least likely to obtain adequate prenatal care, the most vulnerable to government monitoring, and the least able to conform to the white middle class standard of motherhood. Now, statutes drafted and some enacted these days dramatically exceed the prior limits, sort of exceed what she talked about years ago, extending beyond poor pregnant African American uh, women and their illicit drug use, including crack. Contemporary fetal protection includes sanctioning women for refusing cesarean sections, forcibly confining them to bed rest, and instigating prosecutions for otherwise legal conduct. Uh, as I'll talk about, this includes women falling downstairs. For example, a woman in Iowa was uh, confined for three days in a jail because she fell down steps and had told her medical provider that when she first discovered that she was pregnant, she had considered having an abortion, but that was 20 weeks before. Now it's very interesting about the sort of what's happening today versus um, years ago is that um, over a hundred years ago, it was a very different way in which the law regarded women and their pregnancies. In fact, it was pretty well ensconced in U.S. law that a woman could not be prosecuted for her behavior during her pregnancy. And the reason why is that courts, U.S. courts found that they could not do this because a child needed to be born alive. Basic idea meaning that fetuses did not have personhood. But now, contemporary fetal protection laws um, ignore this particular history and the history for it. In Alabama, for example, a recently enacted law uh, now includes an unborn child at any stage of development, uh, regardless of viability, is a person and a human being for purposes of criminal state law. In 2013, uh, the Alabama Supreme Court further expanded fetal rights in that state by interpreting the ch term child to be synonymous with not only a viable fetus, but also a non-viable fetus. And the Alabama Supreme Court uh, did this recognizing that that would be inconsistent with the Supreme Court, the U.S. Supreme Court's holding in Roe v. Wade. Um, the Alabama Supreme Court uh, basically upheld this in a case by the name of Ex Part uh, Ancrum, finding that it was illegal under the statute um, not only for pregnant women in that state to ingest illicit substances, but also to even enter locations wherein illicit substances are manufactured and sold. So the point that I want to, to make um, is that across the country there has been a wide swell, well, a swelling of legislation, if you will, to pay attention to women's pregnancy. And there's disparate enforcement on the ground. So one might think that so long as a law is written and enacted, it will be applied equally to all people. But the point that I wish to make is that those who happen to be at the lowest rungs of society in terms of their economic status experience these laws in a very different kind of way than do people who are better off. And some of this really isn't new. And by that, I mean to say that uh, decades ago, in fact, during Don Draper's time, right? He's, he's born in the 1920s. It's 1927 when the US Supreme Court holds in Buck v. Bell that it's better for all the world than to let the imbecilic starve for their imbecility, that society is better off from uh, denying those to continue their kind, and that 
three generations of imbeciles are enough and that the, the authority that a state has to inoculate individuals is the same authority that the state has to forcibly sterilize individuals in those states. What the Supreme Court was doing during that time was giving legal authority to the state of Virginia and all states across the country to sterilize individuals that were considered to be socially unfit. And the case involved a 16-year-old girl named Carrie Buck. She was a girl who had been raped, just as Don Draper had been raped. And she, there was a pregnancy resulting from that rape. Um, the state of Virginia wanted to and did incarcerate Carrie because she was deemed to be socially unfit. And the state also wanted to sterilize her so that she would never be able to have another child and therefore populate the state of Virginia with unfit people. The state had already incarcerated Carrie's mother. Carrie's mother had been a prostitute and she was an alcoholic. The case was really a test case going before the US Supreme Court. And it was Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes, who's one of the most revered justices to have ever served on the US Supreme Court, who issued uh, such a stunning opinion, which opened the door for US eugenics. A piece that's lost in history is that the Virginia law, which was a model law for eugenics, was actually the basis for the eugenics law that was adopted by Nazi Germany. At one point in time, US legislators said, the Germans are beating us at our own game. The reason why I raise that issue is because in this country, when we had this urgency to sterilize those that we deemed to be socially unfit. It was not the wealthy that were rounded up and placed in colonies across the United States. These were poor people. These were poor white people. Some of these were people of color, but interestingly enough, many of those people uh, were white. And fascinatingly, uh, and, and if you want to know more about this, there's a wonderful documentary called The Lynchburg Story. Fascinatingly, it became such an accepted social and medical and legal expression in the United States that in the advertisement for the coming attractions at movies, we would advertise, states would advertise how many people had been sterilized. California, 6,000. Virginia, 3,000, and so forth. More states had eugenics laws than not across the United States. One other tidbit, um, that I want to share before returning to the thrust of the, the talk is that coming from the state of Minnesota, people really do believe in the state fair. And many of you have probably attended state fairs. There's probably a state fair that takes place here. What many people don't know is that prior to pinning the flag or the ribbons on our pigs and our cows, we did this to people. We had fitter family contests at uh, state fairs across the country where white families would show up and where the bluest eyes really did matter, the bluest eyes and the blonder hair. And it's worth uh, checking the websites, the databases at the Library of Congress and others so that you can see these images, right? This was the United States during Don Draper's time, the 1920s and the 1930s. So my concern is about how we are implementing these laws that are concerned about women's pregnancies and the shifting role of medical personnel in fetal protection law cases. Nurses and doctors increasingly interpret and implement state fetal protection laws um, and key statutory provisions. More than one third of states now consider pregnant women's illicit drug use as a form of child abuse, resulting in unprecedented forms of criminal and civil punishment. Several states permit civil confinement of pregnant women to protect their fetuses, including the state of Minnesota. Uh, 15 states mandate doctors and nurses to report pregnant women whom they suspect of illicit drug use, establishing a low and vague threshold of suspicion rather than actual proof. And one of the things that I'll share with you in terms of what this pipeline creates, we're very clear in the law about liberties, very clear about what is owed to individuals when the state suspects an individual of committing a crime. 
any of you who've watched Law and Order know about Miranda Wright, that police must, in interrogating individuals that they hold under suspicion of committing a crime, they inform them that they have the right to remain silent. They inform them that what they say may be held against them in the court of law. What's very interesting about sweeping doctors into this role is that doctors don't have to say that to their patients, even when they're doing that function for the state collecting the information and the evidence that later on will be used against the patients. Healthcare professionals reporting obligations arise in part due to the influence of federal legislation. The Keeping Children and Families Safe Act of 2003 mandates that states receiving federal funds for child abuse and neglect services must promulgate regulations requiring healthcare professionals involved in the delivery of infants to identify women who have used illegal substances during their pregnancy. But, and, and that's often the first step in police notification. Uh, but what explains healthcare providers' decisions to report or to threaten to report non-drug related cases? So if federal law says you must do some reporting if you think that there's been the suspicion of some illicit drugs, then why do doctors do it when there's no drug cases um, on the table. When Lisa Epstein indicated that she wanted to wait two additional days for a vaginal delivery rather than undergo the cesarean section recommended by her doctor, Jerry Yankowitz, chairman of the University of South Florida's Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology, this is what he did. He sent the mother of five, so it's not as if she hadn't had children before, but he sent this mother of five a threatening email and here's what it said. I would hate to move to the most extreme option, which is having law enforcement pick you up at your home and bring you in, but you're leaving me with no choice. Was that really leaving him with no choice? <laughs> to threat to call the police to bring her in so that he could forcibly cut open her womb? Epstein knew that she had a complicated high-risk pregnancy, but did not expect the threat or involvement of law enforcement in giving birth. She recounted to the Tampa Bay Times reporter her fears about, quote, cops on my doorstep taking me away from home in front of my children to force me to having surgery. She recounted feeling betrayed, bullied, and abandoned by her doctor. Eventually, the medical staff at the hospital backed down, but this was only because Lisa Epstein, who comes from a more affluent background, contacted a lawyer, and that lawyer contacted the National Advocates for Pregnant Women, and they sent a cease and desist letter demanding Dr. Yankowitz cease and desist any further threats or actions against uh, that patient. And she was a more sophisticated woman. She had a lawyer, and she could do that. In their politicized roles as deputized interpreters of law, physicians and nurses may misinterpret law, or even worse, may prioritize exercising their legal judgment over their medical judgment. In this context, physicians and nurses are called upon to wear two hats. First, that of the healthcare provider, and then that of the law enforcer. Now, there are three main conflicts that arise when medical personnel act as both the healthcare provider and also the law enforcer. First, patients' interest in their health and privacy may become subordinate to physicians' desires to accommodate or promote the state's interest. Indeed, physicians and nurses may fear civil or criminal punishment for failing to perform um, these duties um, that are obligated by the state. They may fear their own criminal punishment if they don't inform on their patients. Second, physicians' legal duties to comply with law enforcement protocols may conflict with their ethical duties to their patients, including maintaining confidentiality and also avoiding malfeasance. And third, physicians' obligations to the profession may conflict with obligations of law enforcement by interfering with physicians' independent medical judgment. 
Importantly, in addition to any conflicts of interest that might arise in these contexts, medical professionals' legal decisions may also be at odds with patients' constitutional rights. Now, cases across the country illustrate this, and I'm going to give you some of these narratives, offer some of these to you, and I select these. This is not it's not cherry picking. Cherry picking in the law is when we say that you know, you're just using sort of isolated cases, but there are really a whole lot, a lot of other cases that don't conform to that particular truth. But these are just some that I'm picking out. There are hundreds of others. Um, as I mentioned, in Alabama, just in the last year, there have been over 60 prosecutions of pregnant women um, just for um, entering uh, a meth lab there. Um, so let's start off. Um, in uh, 2010, during a routine uh, prenatal visit, Samantha Burton's physician ordered bed rest at the hospital for the duration of her pregnancy when she was only 25 weeks pregnant. While recommending bed rest to a patient is nothing unusual at all, seeking a court order to enforce it is another matter. In her particular case, she had a couple of kids. She was a working single mother. She had kids literally to get back to. Doctors cut that short. They sought a court order right away. Couldn't even get home. Couldn't even get a second opinion. Yet officials at the hospital Burton visited did just that, setting into action a plan to obtain a court order allowing the hospital to confine Burton against her will. In the process, these officials refused to consider Burton's protestations for a second opinion, her desire to return home to her two children, or her plea to switch to a different hospital. Instead, Burton was relegated to conditions emblematic of solitary confinement. She remained alone in a dreary hospital room until her fetus died and was surgically removed from her womb three days later. Forced medical solitary confinement, while distinct from prison solitary confinement, shares relevant parallels that trigger human and constitutional rights concerns pertaining to the deprivation of liberty, forced institutional restraint, isolation from the general population and community, the denial of contact, the loss of freedom to move within a facility, there can be a mental health deterioration, um, and also, of course, stigma. Individually and collectively, conditions such as these raise significant concerns related to human dignity, so much so that U.S. Senator Dick Durbin cautioned that only when, quote, absolutely necessary should solitary confinement be even used in a prison. So if it should only be absolutely necessary to use it in a prison, why would we use it against a pregnant woman? The same is true in medicine, those concerns that we would have in prison, you should think about in medicine. Senator John McCain recounted from a personal experience that, quote, it's an awful thing, solitary. He said, it crushes your spirit and it weakens your resistance more effectively than any other form of mistreatment. More than a century ago, the US Supreme Court recounted the devastating effects of solitary confinement on prisoners. The US Supreme Court said, a considerable number of prisoners fell ill after even a short confinement into a semi-fatuous condition from which it was next to impossible to arouse them, and others became violently insane. Others still committed suicide, and in most cases did not recover sufficient mental activity to be of any subsequent service to the community. In 2012, the Senate Judiciary Committee Subcommittee on the Constitution, on the Constitution Civil Rights, and Human Rights took up these concerns in a hearing entitled Reassessing Solitary Confinement the human rights, fiscal, and public safety consequences. Senator Patrick Leahy issued a statement acknowledging that, quote, although solitary confinement was developed as a method for handling highly dangerous prisoners, it is increasingly being used with inmates who do not pose a threat to staff or to other inmates. 
Among those forced into confinement are many who, quote, really don't belong there. And they are from vulnerable groups like immigrants, children, and those who are LGBT. Hospitals, just like prisons, um, are no less powerful um, psychological uh, spaces. And in that particular case, which I'd love to share more uh, with you about it, it was fascinating uh, because the case truly did involve a considerable discretion that was provided to the medical professionals. It's as if the judge swallowed wholesale what it was that was offered um, by the doctors. Um, Burton's experience was an alarming illustration of the unconstitutional constraints imposed on pregnant women's right to security in their body. Interestingly enough, she was actually not afforded any attorney during that entire uh, process at all. And the judge involved the case, granted the confinement order, um, and denied Burton um, the right to switch hospitals because, quote, such a change is not in the child's best interest at this time. Note that she was pregnant. There wasn't um, a, ch a child yet. And he gave very broad authority for doctors to do whatever it was, almost verbatim, whatever the doctors needed to do to protect uh, the child. Like Samantha Burton, Christine Taylor, a 22-year-old pregnant mother of two living in Iowa, did not anticipate that a medical visit could result in her incarceration. Christine Taylor's crime was to trip and fall down the stairs during a second trimester of her pregnancy. After receiving treatment from emergency medical technicians, she voluntarily sought further care at a hospital. During interviews with a nurse and a doctor, Taylor, who happened to be a Maryland native, confided that she felt ambivalent about her pregnancy during the early stages of her pregnancy. It's relevant that she was from Maryland because her husband had moved back to Maryland. She was living alone and with the kids and supporting them on her own. She shared intimate details about her estranged husband's threat um, that he was going to divorce her. He had already moved back to Maryland. Taylor explained her anxieties to an, ex to an Iowa reporter later. And here I was, alone, pregnant, with two young kids, and with no family around and no support. I just thought, it's not fair. I was so upset and frantic, I almost blacked out, and I tripped and fell. She informed medical staff that because of this and the prospect of raising three children as a single parent, she had considered both adoption and also an abortion after learning about her pregnancy. After disclosing this to her care providers, they alerted the police because they interpreted Taylor's case to fit within Iowa's criminal feticide statute, which, quote, prohibits intentionally terminating a human pregnancy after the end of the second trimester of the pregnancy. Now, it's difficult to know exactly what triggered the medical staff's call to the police, other than the fact that they believed Christine Taylor had attempted to kill her fetus. Was it a misinterpretation uh, and a misperception that even considering an abortion during the first trimester of a, per of a pregnancy served as sufficient evidence um, weeks later uh, of a harm to uh, terminate her pregnancy? According to a reporter who interviewed Taylor, quote, she believes the personal views of medical workers played a part in the decision to accuse her of attempted feticide. Could it have been that she lacked credibility to medical staff who assumed that given her earlier ambivalence about the pregnancy, the fall was in fact a surreptitious attempt to abort her fetus? Or might this case simply be about a perceived medical duty to report? It could be any of these particular um, circumstances. Taylor's pregnancy survived her fall. Nevertheless, she was arrested shortly after leaving the hospital and returning home to her children. Two squad cars intercepted her taxi, and officers arrested her. Christine Taylor was incarcerated at the local jail for two days while police launched an investigation to determine whether she meant to kill her fetus by tripping in her home. 
For three weeks, local prosecutors pursued their attempted feticide investigation against her until the case was dropped. But according to the prosecutor, only because Taylor was in the second trimester of her pregnancy and not the third when she fell is what brought her outside of the feticide statute, suggesting that while well, the medical staff had just simply made a mistake in interpreting the law, had she just been another few weeks along, then he would have pursued this feticide case. In both Christine and Samantha's cases, physicians erred in their interpretations of law. There was no legal foundation for the forced confinement and cesarean section ordered in Samantha Burden's case, and Christine Taylor's doctor lacked sufficient legal grounds to alert law enforcement against her. And as we all know, tripping down the stairs is nothing that, uh, it's, it's not a crime. Now, in another case, why, why, I mean, gosh, it's, imagine, right, just what being pregnant, uh, what, what this opens uh, the, the door to. Uh, in Utah, uh, there's a, a criminal law statute that provides for uh, the criminal prosecution of women who engage in reckless conduct during pregnancy. Now, when you think about it, you know, what do we consider reckless? You know, going to Disneyland? Uh, and going on a ride with your kids while pregnant, uh, is that something that happens to be reckless? Uh, we know that lemon-based juices and products can have an emagogic effect, so if you drink too much lemonade during pregnancy, is that something that constitutes reckless conduct? We could go down the list with the things that could be interpreted under this view to be reckless. Now, in Rennie Gibbs' case, it's an ongoing criminal prosecution in Mississippi for depraved heart murder of her dead fetus. Um, and I'll tell you, you know, about this because it further illustrates the extent to which physicians and medical staff may misconstrue and misinterpret fetal protection laws. Now, despite a judge recently throwing out her case, prosecutors claim that they may, in fact, uh, bring it about again. As with Christine Taylor's encounter at a hospital in Iowa, which arrested in her arrest, the prosecution of Rennie Gibbs, an African-American teen, hinged on the doctor's control of her conduct toward her stillborn infant. In Gibbs' case, the medical examiner claimed that uh, her drug addiction, which did not abate during pregnancy, demonstrated indifference towards the life of her fetus, and its death was the direct result of her depraved heart. Her arrest and prosecution following a traumatic prenatal uh, perinatal outcome is yet another example of a misuse and misapplication of medical information for politicized reproductive purposes. Now, in her case, um, she was 15 years old when she was uh, pregnant and barely 16 when she gave birth and she uh, had a stillborn and she was charged as an adult and a successful prosecution was going to mean life in prison for her. Um, I'll tell you another case that I was recently involved with as an expert witness is a case um, in Indiana that involved Bei Bei Shui. Some of you may have heard of her name. She's a Chinese immigrant, and uh, with Bei Bei, her boyfriend uh, left her uh, crying in a parking lot shortly before Christmas a couple years ago. Uh, she was pregnant, and he was going to leave her and actually go back to his, his wife. Uh, she decided that she would kill herself, and she attempted to do that. She went home, and she, uh, she bought, before going home, uh, rat poison, and she ate five packets of rat poison. Uh, a friend of hers uh, discovered her and took her to the hospital where physicians engaged in very aggressive uh, medical therapies uh, to rescue her life and also that of uh, her fetus. They induced uh, delivery, and uh, the child survived for about four days, uh, and Bebe Shui, uh, survived this encounter and for several months was then in a mental health facility uh, given her own trauma. Interestingly, when she came through her trauma, uh, prosecutors charged her with first degree murder. Now, this despite the fact that in the state of Indiana, it is not a crime to attempt to kill yourself at all. Uh, and the case 
was it wasn't dropping. Mean, she the the prosecutor dropped the the first degree murder charges uh, in the case, which would have resulted if she were convicted uh, for more than forty five years in prison. And uh, he accepted, uh, she accepted, he offered eventually a uh, misdemeanor uh, plea deal, but this was after my deposition and getting many politicians and things like that involved. The very interesting bit about that case is that the state of Indiana has a feticide law on its books, and so she was charged with first degree murder and also attempted feticide and attempted because the baby was actually born, so it wasn't an attempt to kill the fetus. But what is very interesting about that is that um, the prosecutions under the feticide law, which were originally intended to help women during their pregnancy against violence committed against them by third parties, such as domestic violence, is what it was. the law was lobbied for and originally passed. Two major cases resulted in the following. So Bebe was being prosecuted, and the prosecutor was very clear, you want her in jail for the rest of her life, at least 45 years. Two major cases involving this particular law, one involved a guy who uh, came to his girlfriend's house in the middle of the night, uh, attempted to kill her friends, and to kill her, and stabbed her in the, in the womb, and I believe she died. The, enhancement under the feticide law, so the feticide law part of it, three years. Now he had extra time for the other crimes, but only three years on the feticide part. In another case that involved a bank robber, uh, he goes to a bank, he jumps over the teller's counter, and she's pregnant with twins. He shoots her in the abdomen, five years for both. Uh, fetus. So it was very interesting, I thought, the way in which the prosecutor was going after Bebe in this particular um, case. Now, as I begin to wrap up, I want to just talk about um, a couple of other cases that have been in, in the news, and, and then I'll, I'll wrap up and we can have some Q&A time. Some of you may remember or recall very recently the Texas case involving Marlise Munoz. Um, that's a case in which Texas hospital officials refused to remove the 33-year-old Marlise Munoz, a brain-dead woman from life support, uh, for two months because she was pregnant um, in November uh, when she was about 14 weeks into her pregnancy. It's believed that um, um, there was a blood clot that entered her lungs, and this is what uh, caused her debilitation. And then at the hospital, uh, she was uh, pronounced uh, brain dead. Her family members wanted her removed from life support, uh, but we all learned that Texas has a law uh, that uh, overrides, someone said Texas, uh, that overrides <laughs> Uh, overrides families' uh, wishes in this regard. But interestingly, Texas is one of more than two dozen states that, re that prohibit removing life support from a pregnant woman, right? So it turns out Texas, but then it's not just Texas now, right? Um, and last two cases that I want to, to, to talk about, and I only mention that particular case because it also gives another view of this kind of anxiety around women and their pregnancies. And much of this is happening underground. The discourse that's above ground with regard to pregnancy is about abortion, but the discourse underground, interestingly enough, um, isn't being captured at all. And Interesting, ironically, a lot of it involves women who are actually trying to keep their pregnancies, who are being arrested. And fascinatingly, and some of you probably know this, there are children being raised in prisons in the US right now, and that's considered progressive. We'll let you keep your child with you in prison. You know, don't worry. It can see you shackled and going into the dining hall facilities with other people in orange, and this is a good thing. I mean, how ironic is that? And that we permit this until the kids are age four. Last couple of cases, and then I'll open up for, for Q&A. 
Um, Angela Carter, uh, it's a very interesting uh, case um, because it also involves an end of life tragedy. Uh, Carter was a cancer patient uh, and her cancer went into remission and she went on to, um, the cancer was actually in her youth when she was a kid. She goes on to marry uh, and become pregnant. And it is during the time of her pregnancy that uh, her cancer returns and she requests chemotherapy from her medical providers. Uh, it's the last hope for her in her survival. And she's 28 weeks pregnant at this point, and her doctors refuse to provide her the chemotherapy and actually seek a court order to make sure that she doesn't get the chemotherapy so that they can rescue the fetus. The court asked a doctor, you could hear what the parties were saying to one another, so they asked this doctor who's a witness to the interaction with the doctors who refuse her chemotherapy. And Dr. Weingold says, she does not make sound because of the tube in her windpipe. She nods and she mouths words. One can see what she's saying rather readily. She asked whether she would survive the operation, meaning the C-section and delivery. She asked Dr. Hamner if he would perform the operation. He told her that he would only perform it if she authorized it, but it would be done in any case. So if you authorize it, but I'll do it in any case. She understood that. She then seemed to pause for a few moments and then very clearly mouth words several times, I don't want it done. I don't want it done quite clear to me. Despite this, the doctors performed the cesarean, cesarean section on her, declined, denied the chemotherapy. Uh, the baby survived for two hours and she was dead in two days. So what does this all represent for us? And I'll close with this, and thinking about the fiduciary relationship, criminal leverage, and medical utility. So noticeably absent in the operation of these contemporary fetal protection efforts are these foundational, internationally agreed upon bioethics principles. Informed consent, autonomy, social justice, and voluntary participation. The earliest collected iterations of these principles derived from the adjudicative process in the criminal trials uh, involving Nazi doctors in Nuremberg. These doctors' deliberate disregard for the health and safety of non-consenting human subjects in their research studies on sterilization, interestingly enough, serology, human survival under distressing conditions, and mastery of euthanasia resulted in deaths and severe disabilities among survivors. The Nuremberg doctor's trial contributed to the articulation and establishment of universally recognized human rights principles in law and medicine that specify doctors' fiduciary duties and form the ethical framework for the physician-patient relationship. Originally, these principles defined the general standard for merit medical experimentation on human subjects. However, they now cohere to form the basis of physicians' fiduciary obligations to patients, namely that voluntary consent is an essential component of any kind of medical treatment, that confidentiality happens to be paramount to the physician-patient relationship and should not be trespassed by healthcare providers, that medical treatment should avoid subjecting patients to unnecessary suffering, including but not limited to unnecessary reproductive surgeries. Additionally, patients must be at liberty to withdraw from medical treatment, even if rejecting medical assistance might result in their deaths. And this is incredibly uh, important. There is much more that I could be said about, about all of this, but I just leave you with those closing thoughts about the importance 
of maintaining these very important principles that were deeply ensconced in law more than a half century ago. And it is so ironic that, um, that what we learned from that period so long ago, we now need to revisit in these particular cases. And I'm particularly concerned uh, in these cases because these are the people who happen to be the most voiceless. These are the women who happen to be indigent. These are the women who happen to lack political clout, and they also lack a certain type of social clout. As I began, and I mentioned the story about Carrie Buck and what happened in 1927 to her and how easy it was to just sort of, you know, um, how easy it was to engage in processes of sterilization with women who were like her. The idea is that we had laws that applied to all, but in reality, these laws really didn't apply to all. They applied to people who were like Carrie, poor, indigent, and who came from a troubling family background. I'd say equally, in this era with these new laws, I think we want to be concerned that these really aren't about all women who become pregnant. They're really about certain social classes of women who become pregnant. I want to thank you for hearing me out with this discussion and for inviting me to share these thoughts with you. Thank you.